You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're doing a holiday episode. So, Kenzie. Yes, Lauren. Let's get scary. Boop, boop. I don't have any fun things to tell you this time around. I really don't either. We had a two-hour delay today. Same. But for us, that literally means nothing, so I went to work in my normal time. Why? Because I needed to get extra hours. Oh. Uh-huh. And I didn't want to be there till like, five. That's a bummer. I know. I got there at 10. It was great. <laughs> so... If you get there at 10 and, like, say your normal stuff starts at 8 or whatever, do you just cancel out the stuff that would have started before 10? Yes. Hopefully it was things you didn't like. Uh, no, it was my planning time. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was with them all day. Oh. I didn't get a single break. Because even recess, we, it was inside because it's raining. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was rough. Gross. Inside all day with a bunch of 8-year-olds. Mm. It's already a two-hour early release. They can't go outside for recess. I'm surprised my classroom didn't burn down. <laughs> we, we usually do a walk at work, and we couldn't do one today, so everyone was really upset about that as well, because we always do our 1 p.m. walk. Can't you walk around, like, the building? We were going to, but no one, like, initiated it, and one of the guys I work with was like, Lauren, you initiate it. And I said, no, I always do this. Someone else can do it for once. You always initiating? I know. Wow. I know. You're a new person. I know. I'm a different person at work. Don't know who you are. And so I was like, I'm not. I'm not. Someone else can do it for once. And he goes, oh, okay. And guess what didn't happen? The walk. Because no one else did it. So. Well. Kind of shows you everything truly you can't to. live without you. I, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what they do when I, like, take days off. <laughs> not good for walks. <laughs> That's for damn sure. So I guess we can jump into our holiday facts. I'd love to. I slightly apologize to you. For all these words you're about to make me read? Yep. Yeah. These are some of the longest facts because... When you look online, because it's, like, obviously searching from America, because that's where we are, it gave me a lot of, like, like Christmas facts. Mm-hmm. So I tried to find other facts, and then I did. And then I just kept finding more and more holidays to add to this holiday list. That's fine. All right. We're going to give it a so shot. So go for it, Mackenzie. All right. So all over the world, there are 23 different holidays celebrated in December. Over 23. Over 23 holidays celebrated in December. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to attempt <laughs> to say all of these additional holidays. And if we missed one, please let us know. I found, it's so weird talking in first person when I wasn't the one. I know. This. <laughs> I found this list online, so this is all the knowledge I have to go off of. And just an aside, the article spelt aloud like something was read aloud as aloud. They spelt the word aloud, like read aloud, instead of you're allowed to do something. Or the other way around. But either way, they used the wrong spelling of aloud in the article. And I was like, ooh, we're not off to a great start here. Okay, so they were talking about something like being read aloud, Mm -hmm. but they spelt it A-L-L-O-W-E-D. Like you're allowed to do something. Uh Mm -hmm. And I was like, ooh. Mm -hmm. And then also the article title was Seven Holidays You Celebrate in December, but then there were 32 listed. Or there were, like, a ton list, and I was like, I don't know where your title is wrong, but something's not right here. So it was just, you know, that's why I'm, I'm I said this is just the article we're going to go off of. <laughs> we're going to see what happens. All right. So in alphabetical order. Nope. Oh, no. Just like the first, <laughs> I was just looking at the first couple, so it looked like it was in alphabetical order. <laughs> the first couple are C and B. Oh, yeah. In that <laughs> order. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. <laughs> okay. Hopefully it doesn't pick up his snoring. Is he sleeping? Yes, he is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Not in alphabetical order. <laughs> uh, Chalika, this celebration lasts seven nights, and each night a different principle of the church is honored. Bodai, the day of enlightenment with when Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, achieved enlightenment. Salgira, a holiday to honor Aga Khan the Fourth. Lucia, Lucia, Lucia. Usually, when it's C I, it's Lucia. Okay. Like Saint Lucia. Yeah. Okay. The Italian saint. Got it. <laughs> Lucia, a celebration in honor to honor Lucia, an Italian saint. Saturnalia, the celebration of the winter solstice. There's a lot of celebrations of the winter solstice. Oh yeah. Modern, also known as Mother's Night, another celebration of the winter solstice. Pancha Ganapati, a five-day vest- festival honoring the god Ganesh. Yule, the pagan winter solstice celebration in a way to honor the holiday in its original form. Goddess is also honored as she gave birth to the sun god. Which goddess? I don't know. Oh. It just said goddess and it was like capital G. You know? 
Mm, yeah. So I guess maybe that's just her name. And okay. goddess. Dong Z Festival. They also spelled festival wrong. Okay, so all of these could be made up. They could be, but <laughs> they might not be. So I included them. Okay. <laughs> Watch this be saying something that's in like fucking April. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of these are like the celebration of winter. Yeah. Like so what the Gonzi Festival is. Yeah. Uh, is the celebration of winter. Newton Miss, a Christmas alternative to many atheists and agnostics to mark the birthday of Sir Isaac Newton. Kwanzaa, a celebration to honor the African heritage and African American culture. Kolida, a winter festival loosely affi- affiliated with the winter solstice. Boxing Day, <laughs> a day, I was going to say a day to box. A <laughs> uh, day meant to stay home and spend time with family. I think it's a little bit, it's more than that. Because it's like, like right after Christmas or something. Ah, <laughs> is this an interesting holiday? It's an uninteresting holiday? No, it's interesting. Why? Boxing Day in Great Britain and some Commonwealth countries, particularly Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, the holiday on which servants, tradespeople, and the poor traditionally were presented with gifts. By the 21st century, it had become a day associated with shopping and sporting events. So it's basically their Black Friday. Okay. Yeah. So they give us so much shit for it, and they have their own fucking... <laughs> You can give thanks and then you go shopping. Um, you just celebrated Christmas and then you go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Hanukkah spelled wrong, by the way. That's the American version or the English version. That was how it was in the article. So I just followed the article. Just saying it's supposed to have CH. Okay. Hanukkah, <laughs> the festival of lights, where each day for eight days a candle is lit to commemorate the Holy Temple's rededication to Jerusalem. That's not. That's what the article said. Right. <laughs> I'm going off of what this one article said. You can fix it if you had read over any of them. Oh, no. Something with the oil and something with Jerusalem. Oh, okay. You're not wrong. Thank you. It's just not very specific. Yeah, I know. I didn't go too specific into it. Yeah. Because I was like, Mackenzie will probably talk more about Hanukkah. Well, because it talks about, like, with the temple, they had the the oil. That's why it lasted for eight days. Yeah. Miracle. A miracle. Hogmanene. Hogmanene? Hogman. Hogmanene. <laughs> Hogmanene. <laughs> is the Scottish New Year's. St. Barbara's Day, a day to honor St. Barbara. <laughs> Festivus? Festivus. Festivus. A festivus for the rest of us. Ah. Shout out to Seinfeld. A celebration that includes the feats of strength and the airing of grievances. I like that. And you have the Festivus pole, which is your tree. Oh. It's literally just a pole. It's very fun. Interesting. Yeah. Krampus notched. Yeah. Pretty much means Krampus night. Oh. I should just say that. Because that's not the name of it. <laughs> People will dress up as Krampus and search the streets for naughty children. Naughty children receive coal and good children receive candies. I talked about Krampus in our holiday episode last year. Uh, St. Nicholas Day is the Christian version of Krampus Knot. And it honors St. Nicholas. Small presents are left for good children. Las Posadas, a nine-day Mexican holiday that commemorate the journey that Mary and Joseph took to Bethlehem. Christmas. Uh, I'm sure most people know what Christmas is, but it, its origins are to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ. Even though many people believe he was born in the spring. Yeah, wasn't his, his birthday like actually March? Something like that. Okay. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, new Year's Eve, ringing in the new year. Obviously. Obviously. I, read, I saw this one too. Zar, Zara Thos. Zarathustra. Say it fast. Zarathustra. <laughs> I highly doubt <laughs> that's the way that's pronounced. Zarathusht. Okay. Zarathusht. Diso, or death of the prophet Zarathustra. Okay. Celebrates and commemorates the death of the prophet Zarathustra. Did you know that this, you know, I'm going to make up for not knowing how to pronounce it by knowing information about it, um, that this uh, religion is what historians believe to be the oldest monotheistic religion that was believed in. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. So there you go. So we included a lot, but we wanted to make sure that we mentioned as many as we could uh, to make sure that everyone felt included during this time of year. Yeah. Kwanzaa was created in 1966 by Dr. 
Mulana Karinga to celebrate family, culture, and heritage. At this point, I strayed away from just the holidays and I went into more, like from the list of holidays. Yes. And went into more facts. Yes, yes, yes. 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 It was modeled after the first harvest celebrations in Africa. Each time for seven nights, a different core principle is honored. In 1836, Alabama was the first state to officially recognize Christmas, and it wasn't declared an official holiday in the U.S. until June 26, 1870. That was right after the uh, Civil War. And Oklahoma was the last. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Uh, They didn't declare it an official holiday until 1907. 33 million real Christmas trees are sold annually, and that's just in the United States. The tallest Christmas tree ever displayed was in Seattle, Washington. It measured to be 221 feet tall. Roasted potatoes are the most popular Christmas dish, uh, potatoes, period. Mm -hmm. Followed closely by another form of potatoes, mashed. Because everyone fucking loves potatoes. I freaking love potatoes. There's not a form of potatoes I don't like. Right. Like, any version of a potato that you want to give me, I will eat it. Mm -hmm. I think we are doing... um scalloped potatoes this year for christmas Ooh, mom good. was like can we do scalloped potatoes and those i said good. okay my grandma makes good scalloped potatoes oh, i love them apparently there is a popular christmas tradition in japan and the tradition is to eat kfc this is such a popular tradition that orders have to be put in two months in advance um did you know that on christmas many jews order chinese food because it's the only thing open <laughs> joe and i do that on christmas eve we're oh, the chinese fun. food yeah when I was with my mom over Christmas, we had a very Jewish Christmas. No, all fun. And we ordered Chinese food. We went to the beach. Fun. There was actually a ton of people there. Well, yeah. Why not? Spending well, not. Christmas at the beach. When we used to have to go visit Jared in Kentucky, we were at a military base on Christmas. So we had like sushi one Christmas. We went to the movies one Christmas. <laughs> they were very untraditional Christmases. We go to the movies. Yeah. We always go to the movies on Christmas. It was fun. Uh, in Ukraine, spiders are considered good luck during the Christmas season. Not me. Mm-mm. Mackenzie, can you, can you name all nine reindeer? Mm-hmm. All right. You know Dasher and Dancer. No. You yeah. know Dasher yeah. and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen. Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen. But do you recall <laughs> the most famous reindeer of all? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Reindeer. See? Did oh. you ever read the book All of the Other Reindeer? No. There's a book um, about a reindeer. Her name was Olive. Huh. Like Olive, the other reindeer. Aww. Yeah, it was super oh, cute. That's cute. <laughs> it was such a cute kid's book. Uh, reindeer can see in the dark. I almost had a scary story about a weird reindeer, but like I said, it didn't end up comparatively to the other two. Oh, okay. A funny fact from this page. One in three men wait until Christmas Eve to do their holiday shopping. Me too. I was at work today and we were talking about holiday shopping and some of the guys I work with were like, yeah, I haven't really started yet. And other guys were like, I started a little bit. And I said, can I read you an interesting fact? And so I read them this. I haven't and started at all either. Oh, I have. Um, I'm like done pretty much. Oh. Yeah. But um, I thought it was very funny. And all the men were like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All of my Christmas gifts are in this general area. I like in my defense, I always underestimate how quickly Christmas just pops up. Oh, I know. Like I was the same way. Like a couple of months ago, I was like, I have plenty of time and then all of a sudden it's two weeks until christmas and i'm like oh my god yeah so Mm -hmm. this will be fun yep during the christmas season visa credit cards are used about six thousand times every minute Mm -hmm. damn every year norway sends a christmas tree to britain as a symbol of gratitude for their help in world war ii with preserving norwegian liberty wow that's kind of nice i know around the world santa has over 30 different names the tradition of leaving milk and cookies out for santa dates back to 1896 And what do you think is the highest grossing Christmas movie? That would be Home Alone. But in an article from 2021, it said that Dr. Seuss, the Grinch, the cartoon 2018 version. Not the cartoon one. The 2018 version was the one with Jim Carrey. No, it wasn't. 2018? The one with Jim Carrey? That did not come out in 2018. The cartoon one definitely didn't. Not the old cartoon. There is a new cartoon version oh maybe that one now i'm curious came out in like the early 2000s oh my god it came out in 2000 exactly wow (laughs) you know how like you think of things and you're like oh 1970 was only like 30 years ago but it was actually 50 years ago over 50 years ago that's kind of where my head was i was like yeah that was definitely 2018 was totally the one with jim carrey (laughs) (laughs) oh man time just doesn't make sense oh no time is a social construct (laughs) Anywho, sir, 
During Hanukkah, 17.5 million donuts are eaten in Israel. Yum. Oh, yeah, because you always do fried food. Yeah. It's like the thing of fried food. <laughs> guess what? Fried potatoes. Latkes. And Lots guess what the next bullet point is? Many traditional Hanukkah foods are fried in oil <laughs> to symbolize the oil burning for eight days. <laughs> Uh, my grandma had this awesome connection a collection of menorahs and i guess you're supposed to everyone's supposed to have their own menorah i didn't know this until i was telling another jewish person that we had all these menorahs and she's like that's what you're supposed to do oh I'm like, ah, look at that so we each had our own my stepdad had a motorcycle because he rides motorcycles yes mine was winnie the pooh oh and i forget what my stepsisters was didn't you have one that was a moose Yes. Mm. I had one that was a moose and a moose dressed as a rabbi <laughs> and his antlers were the more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Loved him. That's what I remember. You know, those like pottery paint thingies, like where you can go to the place you paint the pottery. Oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I made one of those for my grandma because she collected them. Cute. She had one that was like, it looked like the New York City skyline. Oh, pretty. Yeah. She had like a whole like cabinet just filled with all these different beautiful crafted menorahs. Yes. That would be pretty. Now I have one that you just plug it in to a USB and you press a little button. Oh, nice. And then when all of them are lit up, it can dance. Oh, <laughs> And it even cute. lights up in the right direction. How cute. Did you know that you have to go from right to left? I did not. Yep. And you use the middle candle to light each one. I knew that. Okay. That's the part I did know. Yeah. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. The world's largest menorah was located in New York City and was built and lit in 2017. It was 36 feet tall and weighed 4,000 pounds. Whew. It is a tradition in Germany that on the last night of Hanukkah, a gr- giant bonfire will be lit using all of the leftover wicks and oil. That's cool. Then everyone will sing and dance around the bonfire until the early hours of the morning. Which I love. I do too. Some New Year's Eve traditions include eating 12 grapes at midnight or jumping seven waves. Which I don't know where you hmm. would jump seven waves. I feel like Maybe that's interesting to, to be a one or the other. Yeah. Like, I haven't done either. <laughs> yeah, no. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Uh, it's actually bad luck to not kiss someone if you're standing under a mistletoe. And after each kiss, one berry is removed. And once all the berries are gone, no more kisses. Which I didn't know about. I didn't know mistletoe. either. Jingle Balls was the first song played in space. And it was actually and originally a Thanksgiving song. Yeah. That's weird. I know. Uh, Snow can come in different colors, but different environmental elements can change its color, like dust or algae. In 2010, in Kransnodor, Russia, pink snow fell, and it was a sweet smell and reportedly a sweet taste. It was called watermelon snow. Ooh. Yeah. And speaking of Russia, they have a station on Antarctica, and that station recorded a temperature of negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 53 degrees Celsius on July 21st, 1883. 1983. 1983. That is stupid cold. I know. But yeah, I just kind of went a little overboard with Summit to Facts because I just kept finding facts. And so I just kept going. That's fine. Good. I'm glad because, you know, there are a lot. (laughs) What are you talking about today? So today I am talking about the Lawson Family Massacre. Oh. So I had a really hard time finding a true crime case for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Everything, really? Yes. Everything was either really sad or it made me really sad or I just didn't feel like going as dark as some of the cases went uh, because it was Christmas yeah. and like holidays. So I had to pick something else. So I decided on a case that happened many moons ago in 1929. All that is left of the Lawson family is a haunting family portrait and an even more haunting tale. In 1911, a man named Charles Lawson married a woman named Fanny Manring. The two had eight children together, and in 1918, they moved their family to Germantown, North Carolina, which, as I was doing the research for this, I was like, I know this case. And I was like, maybe I've just listened to too many podcasts about it because I knew all the little details. That's why I asked you, like, can you please check to make sure we haven't done this yet? Because it just felt so familiar. So the family worked as tenant tobacco farmers with a profit-sharing system, all the while working hard to save up money to buy their own farm. But tragedy struck in 1920 when their son William, who was only six at the time, died of an illness. Trying to move on, the family finally saved enough money, and in 1927, they were able to buy their own farm on Brook Cove Road, a 200-year-old farmhouse. In 1929, just a few days before Christmas, Charles, who was 43, took his wife Fanny, who was 37, and their seven children into town to buy new outfits and to get a family portrait taken at a Winston-Salem photographer studio. The family consisted of Marie, 17, Arthur, 16, Carrie, 12, Maybelle, 7, James, 4, Raymond, 2, and Mary Lou, 4 months. There will be a test on the names and ages after. Wait, <laughs> say him again. I'm kidding. 
Well, but, but say them again. <laughs> Marie, 17. Mm-hmm. Arthur, 16. Carrie, 12. Maybell, 7. James, 4. Raymond, 2. And Mary Lou, 4 months. Mary Lou. What? I don't know if I'm feeling like it's familiar because you just said it. you think it's familiar or like if I actually recognize something. I guess you'll see soon. Okay. Because once I get into it, you'll be like, ah, yep. Some people viewed this behavior as odd. The Lawsons were a working class rural family going into town and spending money on new outfits and a family portrait was sort of unheard for at the time. But others characterized Lawson as a well-to-do farmer. So this pre-Christmas spending spree was nothing unreasonable. Christmas morning finally rolled around. Marie, the eldest daughter, had woken up early and was busy baking a cake for after dinner that night. It was a two-layer cake that had an icing filling. She was getting it all ready for the family festivities that were going on later that day. Arthur, the eldest son, was out with his father rabbit hunting. I assumed to get meat for their meal that night because that's what people did then. But soon enough, the pair ran out of shotgun shells and Charles sent Arthur into town to grab more. And then we're just going to dive on into it. So once Arthur was gone, this is when Lawson went to retrieve his 12-gauge shotgun and went to his tobacco barn. It was around noon when his daughters, Carrie, 12, and Mabel, 7, were heading out to their aunt and uncle's house and were passing the tobacco barn on their way out. Lawson set his gun, and when Carrie and Mabel were in range, he shot his two daughters with his shotgun. What the fuck? To ensure that the two were dead, he then bludgeoned them. What? Once he was sure they were dead, he placed both of their bodies in the tobacco barn. Why? He then made his way to the house, where he saw Fanny sitting on the porch. With no warning, he shot her as well. Marie was in the kitchen, still working on the cake, but when she heard the gunshot, she started screaming. James, four, and Raymond, two. <laughs> your face. Uh, James, four, and Raymond, two, the two younger boys, also heard it and immediately tried to find a place to hide. A place to hide from their father. Lawson stepped into the kitchen and immediately shot Marie. He then moved to the hall where the two boys decided to hide. He found them quickly and shot them as well. Now, the only family member in the house, aside from Lawson, was the four-month-old baby, Mary Lou. Her age had nothing to do with anything, and Lawson bludgeoned her to death. (gasps) He then went around to all of his family and arranged each one to have their arms crossed. He then placed a rock, some articles say a pillow, under each family member's head. After he finished this awful task, Lawson headed into the woods. This is just about the time that Arthur, the oldest son, had arrived home, and he was exposed to a truly horrible and grisly scene. He must have alerted someone or some neighbors heard the gunshots, because soon many of his neighbors were gathering at the property. As they were seeing the terrible scene before them and trying to figure out what was going on, they heard one final gunshot ring out from the woods. Where's mom? She was on the porch. That was Fanny. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, she was on the porch and she was shot. A police officer who had arrived quickly ran to the woods and found Lawson's body sprawled out on the ground. The clear cause of death was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He had ended his life in the same way he had ended his family's. Why? Scattered around Lawson were letters that he had written to his parents. The letters did not explain why he had carried out these murders. The officer also noticed that there were footprints circling a tree, to which he supposed meant that Lawson had been pacing around this tree before ultimately taking his life. A quote from Statesville Record and Landmark on December 30th, 1929, described the scene as, quote, Immersed in the clotted blood on the living room floor where the five bodies were found was a little Christmas poem. Most of its words had been blotted out by the red stain oozing over it, but a large number of curious seekers who passed through the death chamber today could plainly make out the words Santa Claus. Isn't that sad? The fuck? I know. The family was laid to rest at Germantown's Browder Cemetery on December 27th, 1929, under a headstone that included every family member's name, even Charles. Under the names was an inscription that says... Quote, not now, but in the coming years, it'll be in a better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears, and then sometime we'll understand. Hmm. Don't know what it means, but I'm assuming understand why the fuck he shot them all. Maybe, but he's buried there too. Well, well, yeah. They'll all understand. He's with them. Yeah. Maybe he can explain. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Um, So a really sad fact. (laughs) What? Just like picture him, like all arriving in heaven and looking at him, like, what the fuck, dude? (laughs) I hope so. Or actually, I hope he doesn't even go to heaven. I, yeah, (laughs) we probably wouldn't, but like, because you just that image, imagine them all, you're like, the fuck was that for? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Okay. So back to that super sad fact. (laughs) Little Mary Lou, the four-month-old, was buried in her mom's arms. You know. Sadly, only 16 years later, Arthur was also laid to rest in the graveyard after getting into a fatal motor accident at the age of only 31, leaving behind his wife and children. At the time, the case gained crazy media attention. It was featured on the front pages of all major newspapers and really gripped the nation. A whole family destroyed by one man, their father and husband. It is said that over 5,000 people came out to the funeral to show their respect to the family. 
but not all of those who attended were friends or family. A large number of attendees had heard about the case, and their morbid fascination brought them out. The road leading to the funeral was lined with cars going back three miles just to attend the funeral that was the result of a horrific attack. That's kind of gross. And it kind of shows that, like, I mean, right now we're listening to true crime and we're talking about true crime. So it's kind of like this was their true crime. So it's kind of in a weird I would way. never show up to someone's funeral. No, I wouldn't either. But it's in a weird way where it's like people's morbid curiosity is still very much I guess that's very true. Much I guess that thing. is there. Yeah. It gets it gets not good either. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so no one has any idea why Charles Lawson would murder his entire family, except, except Arthur. Arthur. And there is no way to know with him being dead. Like Lawson being dead. You could get in a Ouija board or a seance. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> his neighbors in the town, his friends, and his surviving family could just not believe that loved and respected Charlie would have done something this heinous and awful. So, of course, some theories began to swirl. I've used that little phrase in a lot of episodes because I like it. So the first theory is that Charles was not to blame, but rather a brain injury or tumor was responsible. Months before the murder, it is said that Lawson had suffered a serious head injury. He was suffering from frequent headaches following that. Many believe that this head injury altered his mental state and led to the massacres. But after his death, an autopsy had been performed on Lawson, and an analysis of his brain had been conducted at John Hopkins Hospital, and no abnormalities were found. Your hair looks beautiful. It's in my eyes. That's why I'm moving it, because I'm trying to situate my bangs. It's at that length where it's like, I got to keep it in between my eyes or on the side, because Uh. if I put it in front, then it gets in... My. It reminds me of the episode of Friends or like the little season when Monica has her long bangs and they always look like they're in her eyes and it bothers me. Yeah, well, it would be bothersome. It'll look okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Another theory is that maybe Charlie wasn't responsible at all. It is theorized that maybe the family had been witnesses to a crime and that Charlie was a major witness in the crime, so he and his family had been silenced. Yeah. But those close to the family knew that not all was as it seemed to the outside world about the Lawson family. The next theory is about a rumor that goes into that. Some speculate that his daughter Marie was pregnant. Mm. Unmarried daughter Marie. (gasps) This theory didn't really come up until 1990 after the publication of the book White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, written by Trudy J. Smith. The book went on to claim that during a tour of the house shortly after the murders, an anonymous source overheard an awful rumor that Charlie Lawson had been sexually abusing his eldest daughter Marie. Ah! Then just a day before the book was published, the author received a call from Stella Lawson. Stella was a member of the family and had already been interviewed for the book. At that time, she had said, quote, I can hardly take it in after being at the Lawson house and seeing all the love that Uncle Charlie showed his family. But in this call, she had a bit more to say. She said that she had overheard Fanny's sister-in-law and aunt, to include Stella's mother, Jetty, talking. The women were discussing how, at some point, Fanny had confided in them, the mother, that she was concerned about a, quote, incestuous relationship going on between Charlie and Marie. Stella went on to tell Smith, the author, that this conversation had happened a few years prior, meaning that Fanny had been suspicious of this relationship for some time before the murder. And so just to, like, remind people, Marie was 17 at the time of the murder, meaning that she was even younger when her mother started to suspect that something was going on. So she was a child at the time of the murder, a child when any relationship would have been going on. Disgusting. So this is not consent. But her mom is talking about it like it's this affair. Right. And it's not consent if you can't, if you're not at the age to consent. So she was being abused by her father. She was not consenting to a relationship. And yet here mom is like talking as if her husband's cheating on her. Right. Oh, God. If that were me, he would have been the one shot. Oh, 100%. So this theory got even more support when that same author published a second book, The Meaning of Our Tears, in 2006, which goes back to like what the gravestone said. Mm -hmm. In this book, Ella May, a close friend of Marie Lawson, was interviewed when she came forward and disclosed that just a few weeks before that fateful day in 1929, Marie had told her that she was pregnant. That her father, Charles Lawson, sorry, I have an itch on my leg (laughs) and I couldn't move. (laughs) That her father, Charles Lawson, was the one who got her pregnant, and that both her mother and father were aware that she was pregnant. Another neighbor, Sam Hill, said that he knew Charlie had forced himself upon Marie, and that when she did become pregnant, he warned her, like Charlie had warned Marie, that if she told anyone, even her mother, that, quote, there would be some killing done. Hill Hampton, a close friend and neighbor to the Lawsons, said that he knew the family had some serious problems, but he never elaborated on what he meant. So this does seem to show that not all was perfect for this family under the surface, but this theory of Marie being pregnant has never been proven. It wasn't even noted in her autopsy. Would it have been if they weren't looking for it? Oh, yeah. 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 When they do an autopsy, I'm pretty sure they would have found like out they if you were pregnant. they would have seen it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they're like, cut you open. Right. 
Um, but this still seems to be the main theory that many people believe and stick to. But stemming from these stories about why, we have to wonder why Charles let his son Arthur live. Many believe that with Charles being there, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. So Arthur was a young man of 16. He would have probably been able to stop his father from doing what he was doing, or at least greatly slowed him down. Others believe that Charles let him live because he wanted his family name to live on. That's sick. I know. But I mean, it did live on technically because he married, had kids. So not long after the murders, Marion Lawson, Charles' brother, opened the family's house where all the murders took place as a tourist attraction. Oh, sweet Jesus. He charged 25 cents a head to the curious, morbid attendees. And there were a lot of visitors. At its peak, over 500 people would come to take a look at the house. Oh, wow. And, like, remember, it took the front page of newspapers, word spread. People wanted to see this awful crime and where yeah. it took place. But another thing I read was that Mary and the brother started charging money because Arthur had inherited the house and still had to pay. Mm. And so this was a way this for him a way to for, pay. Yeah. That makes sense. Which gives it a much nicer twist if that's what happened. Yeah. So the museum allowed people to walk through the house and sort of see the after effects of this crime frozen in time. On display, one would see some uncleaned blood left inside the house and on the porch. They would be able to gaze upon the portrait that the family took just a few days before the massacre. Even the cake that Marie had baked was on display. And the gross thing, so many people who went on the tour began picking off the raisins that had been on the cake to take as a souvenir. Ew. The cake had to be covered to prevent this from happening further. That's disgusting. And that's not all that was taken from the crime scene. A family member of the family allegedly scooped up some blood that had been on the porch in a jar and kept that as a souvenir. The dogwood tree that Charlie circled after the murders had been stripped bare within just a few hours of the discovery of his body. Oh, my God. The guns he used to carry out the murder and even bricks that came from the house after it was demolished are now kept at, kept as collector's items, and these are usually passed down from one family generation to the next. There was also a song written about the massacres by Kid Smith. Sometime before the house was demolished, he would even perform the song on the porch of the house. Oh, my goodness. Like, it was like a whole show. Yeah. This song actually became one of the most popular and best-selling hillbilly records from 1930, which was, like, actually, I guess, like a genre of music. Mm. It ended up selling over 8,000 copies, which is thousands more than other hillbilly records had sold at the time. The last verse of the song says, quote, They were all buried in a crowded grave while the angels watched above. Come home, come home, my little ones, to a land of peace and love. Mm. Kid Smith believed that Charlie was responsible for the murders, and he follows the theory that Charlie had gotten his daughter pregnant and that had drove him mad. Thinking about the case so much is what drew him to write the song. So I mentioned how the house was demolished. Now in its place, or kind of on its property, stands the Madison Dry Goods Country Store in Madison, North Carolina. I believe it has to be on the same property because back in 1929, the upstairs of the building housed the TB Night Funeral Parlor. Oh. This was the exact funeral parlor where the whole family had been embalmed. Mm. The country store houses a small museum that is dedicated to the family, which includes newspaper clippings and an old photo, old photos of the family. And I wasn't looking for this, but of course, one of the articles mentioned hauntings. Hmm. So due to the nature of the murder, one website stated that the family was buried just outside of the hollowed ground of the church. And for this reason, they may be struggling to find peace and death as they weren't given a truly religious burial. Mm -hmm. It is said that nothing, not even leaves in the fall, will fall onto the grave. Nothing will land on them at all. Richard and Kathy Miller are the proprietors of Madison Dry Goods, and they brought this and they bought this building in 1998. They knew about the building's history with, like, the embalming and the funeral home, but they weren't ready for the hauntings that would come along with it. This museum area gets so many visitors, and many who come to take a look have reported a feeling of dread and a suffocating, all-encompassing feeling of sadness. Employees as well as visitors to the store have reported seeing a little girl in a white dress around the building. <laughs> I know. Objects and pictures have been moved inexplicably. Those who go upstairs to where the funeral parlor once stood report feeling as if they aren't alone and have reported an eerie feeling. Before the house was demolished, curious onlookers were known to break into the house to take a peek around. Some who did this have reported seeing two small children playing around and in the house, only to soon realize after that these were two children from the family portrait. Mm! There is a creek that runs through the land, and a bridge was built to make that creek easy to cross over. Supposedly, that bridge was made from floorboards that were pulled up from the house. That sounds like a good idea. Right. Not haunted at all. Well, it is haunted because (laughs) people have reported that while crossing the bridge, an eerie fog will surround the car, which will then inexplicably turn the car off. A fog then condenses the windows of the car and small handprints will start to appear on the windows. Fuck that. Finally, the driver is able to start the car. They begin driving away and all of a sudden in their rearview mirror, they notice an early 1930s model car gaining on them. As they speed up, so does the old car. And as quickly as it appeared, it will disappear. There is a six-episode show on Netflix called 28 Days Haunted, where psychics and ghost hunters will visit three different haunted locations. One of these locations was the Lawson family's house. 
According to the Warrens, so Ed and Lorraine, who we've talked about many times before, say that it takes 28 days to pierce the veil between the human and the spirit world, which is why the show is called 28 Days Haunted. So the point of the show is that the people go to a house for 28 days and see what they can find. They go for, they stay there Mm -hmm. for 28 days. Yes. For like their experiment project thing. So because of this, Richard and Kathy Miller, the proprietors of Madison Dry Goods, had to close down for a month. They weren't allowed to visit the store during this time to allow the experts to do their thing. And these experts were Jerem Leonard, a self-described demonologist, and Brandy Marie Miller, a fifth-generation psychic medium. Hmm. So the two arrived in Madison into this location with no knowledge of what took place. Um, During their entire time that they were staying here, they weren't allowed to do any research before and weren't allowed and weren't allowed to access the internet for a month while they were doing the show. Okay. So like they had no No knowledge of what was here. Uh, Before even entering the building for the first time, Miller, the medium, said that she sensed two children at the top of a staircase. During their time doing their investigation, thuds were recorded and slamming sounds and flickering lights were seen and heard throughout. Many voices were heard, with one demanding they, quote, get out. At one point, Miller decided to lay in a casket, one that had been upstairs, and as she did so, she entered a trance. All the while, Leonard was leading a mock funeral. Miller said that she got this sensation that victims were gathered around her casket and that a man was standing at the head of the wooden box. She was able to break her trance, and she runs from the room before complaining of pressure sensations in her head. Miller said that throughout her investigations, she was emotionally drained and claimed that dark forces were trying to take advantage of her psyche. She even contemplated leaving the project early, but ultimately decided to stick it out. I will admit, I did not watch the full episode, but if you are interested, you can stream it on Netflix. Hmm. So there you have it, The Lawson Family Massacre. Wow. Yeah. That was quite a story. Yep. Yep. And we'll never know. No, we won't. Which, it makes you wonder why, like, yeah. was he going into debt? Was, but And, know? like, the thing is, is, like... The son never said anything. Right. Like, the son would have the most inside knowledge of whether or not there was turmoil in the Mm -hmm. house. I mean, but it could also be a thing where he just doesn't want to bring up anything like that. You know what I mean? No, and that's totally fair. I don't know. I just feel like... It feels like it was planned, too, because... It was a quick thing I said, but he sent his son to the store to get more shell casings for a shotgun. Right, but he but he clearly used the shotgun. Had some. Yeah. Exactly. So he just wanted his son to be gone. So it seemed like it was clearly planned. And then that portrait that they took was like one of the last pictures that the family ever has or had. So people kind of believe that that was his way to also like show that they had the family and kind of like immortalize, immortalize, yeah. whatever, the family so that like it would always be there and always be a picture of the family. I just mean like the reason no, i definitely I think it was planned oh yeah but no we're never gonna find out the reason that's and it happened almost 100 years ago which is wild to think about that's crazy right like 1929 you don't think is almost 100 100 years ago we're really close to 2029 <laughs> i know we? i don't like it i don't like it either <laughs> so Mackenzie, what are you telling us i got some ghost stories <laughs> I am excited. So this time of year is usually filled with various holiday movies and TV specials that are typically filled with happiness and joy. So I thought I would bring you some holiday stories, but with a spooky twist. And we will begin with a celebration of sorts. And this comes from a time before many of the holidays celebrated during this time even existed. Indigenous people from all over the world have celebrated the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year and marks the first day of winter. While most of the traditions and celebrations are not of the creepy variety, archaeologists have discovered a giant serpent mound created by the Adena Native Americans in Ohio. It's not like creepy looking or anything, but it was a snake. So, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, This is the largest snake effigy in the world, and it spreads across 1,348 feet. Jeez. And the head is pointing towards sunrise on the summer solstice, and the tail points towards the winter solstice. Oh, that's cool. And each year they hold events in celebration of the days. And while it's not spooky in the traditional sense, it is if you don't like snakes. <laughs> but it doesn't really look like a snake. But still, I, you know, just wanted to throw it in there. Of course. <laughs> so next on our list is leaping way forward, not only in time, but in way more creepy and spookiness. So for this legend, we travel to the country of France, where we have Pierre Foutard, who was an innkeeper in 1252. 
who had kidnapped three wealthy boys who were just about to enroll in a boarding school. And with the help, help of his wife, they murdered the three boys and robbed them. Oh, some versions say that they slashed their throats and cut them into pieces and cooked them in a stew. Huh. One version even claims that Pierre Foutard attempted to feed it to St. Nicholas. So when this was discovered, some say he repented, others say it was punishment, but he became an assistant to St. Nicholas. Oh. He sort of became like the anti-Santa. So it did not put him on the naughty list. No. But he would then punish the naughty children with coal or beating them. That seems kind of hypocritical. <laughs> it's what I thought when I read it. I was like, isn't that like giving like an addict like they're... Right. Anyway. So while St. Nick rewarded the nice children, he would reward... The naughty ones. I feel like that was something he liked to do. I feel like that's not fair. Mm -hmm. That he gets to spend the rest of his life, like, hurting people. Right. <laughs> While St. Nick did resurrect the boys, so in true Christmas oh. fashion, okay. it has an happy ending. Okay. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> so, next up on our holiday tour are ghost stories from holidays past. Think campfire stories, but instead of a campfire, it is a fireplace or a space heater. <laughs> and you have fuzzy socks and some sort of warm liquid. Think of the family gatherings where all the cousins get together to hang out after the parents go to bed and start swapping spooky ghost stories. But these ghost stories have a bit of a holiday twist to them. Ooh. So a bit of a disclaimer. Think of these retellings as kind of like the cliff note versions of these short stories that okay. I found. I know I love to talk, but not everyone enjoys me as much as me. <laughs> uh, so if you would like to read the full version, we will put the link in the show notes. Okay. And I also found... Um, these creepy and it scared myself which i am not saying a ton however as we all know my scary barometer is relatively high so i understand <laughs> if these stories don't freak you out in the way they did for me although i really think the second one is fucking creepy i'm really excited i th i think these are kind of scary <laughs> like i'm a little nervous because i'm gonna have to walk to the car outside. Oh outside. my God, that takes three minutes and there are so many lights except there are some creepy times when I go to work and the lights will just like turn off and it's so creepy. Have I told you, have I told you about this thing that happens to me? Okay, I have looked it up because it happens so often. If this happens to anyone else, like let me know. When I am driving down the road, an abnormally high number of street lights will turn on or off as I drive by them. Like, and it's not just like a once in a while thing. Like, there are some weeks where it happens like 10 to 15 times in that week hmm. where I drive or walk by a streetlight and it will turn on or off. And mm. I looked it up and it has a name. Oh. It's like Slider or something, like S-L-I-D, streetlight, something, something or other. But it's so weird and it happens so often to the point where like I'll be on the phone with my mom and I'm like, oh, one just went on. And then I'll like keep driving. And I said, oh, another one just turned off. It is so weird. That is very weird. Mm -hmm. So if that happens to anyone, like, let me know, because it's very odd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is odd. Yeah. It's a very you thing. It is. It is. <laughs> Which is why it will happen sometimes when I'm, like, walking out to my car in the dark, the light will just turn off, and I'm like, of all the times for this to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, no lights. Well, I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> lights do go out in both of these stories. Uh, so this is the story of the game of the Smee. Okay. It was originally written by A.M. Barrage. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's what I'm going to go with. That yeah, sounds really good. This story dates back to the early 1900s. A group of friends and family had gathered together for the holidays. They had just finished a well-cooked meal and were in the mood to play some games. Someone had suggested the game of hide-and-seek. Jackson ha was admittedly against playing this game. No one understood why Jackson did, had such an aversion to this game. It wasn't like him to be such a spoiled sport <laughs> without good reason. Everyone pried him to share why he didn't want to play this game, a game they all enjoyed as young children and felt it would connect them to their youth. Right. Jackson had told everyone that they were all welcome to play and he would just stay in the living room. No need for them to miss it on the fun because of him. By now, everyone was more interested in his story than they were about the game. So he finally caved and shared his experience. But first, you must know how to play the game of Smee. Of course. So every person gets a folded piece of paper and one of those pieces of papers has the word Smee on it. Once everyone has a paper, the lights are turned off, and the person who has SME written on their paper will quietly leave the room and go and hide. So it's pretty much just like hide and seek, but reverse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of everyone hiding and one person look, one, one person, person hides. hides and everybody looks. That's kind of more creepy in a way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Once that person is gone, the remaining scatter to look for SME. 
And if you run into another person, you call it SME. And if that person responds with SME, then it's not it. You go back to looking. Mm -hmm. But if you come across someone and you say SME and they don't answer, then you have found SME and you join them in hiding. You just oh, sit with them. Yeah. Okay. So as others find the SME, they join the group. And the last person to find the SMEs <laughs> loses. <laughs> so. The SMI, plural. Yeah, the SMI. <laughs> the SMI. <laughs> So, Jackson was visiting his cousin's home in Surrey. Surrey? It's in England. Oh, okay. For the Christmas holiday. It took some convincing because Jackson was not sure if he would know anyone in attendance. Upon his arrival, his cousin Violet greeted him and introduced him to the party guests that he did not know. Jackson had arrived later than the other guests and made it just in time for dinner. Jackson thought that he had met everyone when he noticed a woman with dark hair and described her as clever and cold. He was intrigued to know who this woman was, but dinner was starting and he was seated on the other end of the table. As dinner would carry on, he'd meant to ask who this mysterious woman was, but got lost in conversation and forgot to ask. So she's like sitting at the table though. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm just like picturing him at the table looking and there's like just this woman in the corner and I'm like, that's creepy. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. Once dinner was concluded, the guests gathered around to play some games. There weren't any children in the group except for the cousin's son, who was 17, but all the adults were on the younger side and weren't too old to indulge in some childhood fun. Hide-and-seek was once again brought up as a suggestion. Jackson's cousin warned against playing hide-and-seek because of an incident that had occurred in the home 10 years ago. Mm. The home was an old home that had various passages and hallways that could easily get someone lost. When playing the game, this girl had gone to hide and thought she had heard someone coming, so she ran down a passageway to hide in what she thought would be a bedroom, but... The door actually led to some back stairs, and she fell down and broke her neck. Oh. So after retelling that story, the group was a little weary to play the game, and Jackson's cousin suggested the game of Smee instead. After explaining the rules... Which is like the same thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> after explaining the rules, Violet had gathered the 12 pieces of paper for each of the guests and wrote Smee on one of them, mixed them all up, passed them out to each of them... As the game began, all the lights went out, and the group could hear someone quietly sneak out of the room to hide. The others immediately began to search for Smee. The Smee, the first Smee was Reggie, Jackson's cousin's son. Do the lights stay off as you're searching or mm -hmm. no? Oh. He had been hiding in a narrow staircase in the house. He was eventually found by all the players with Jack, his father, being the last to arrive. They all laughed at the fun that they were having and Jack began to count to make sure that they had had everyone. I think we're all here now, aren't we? He remarked. He lit a match, looked up at the staircase and began to count. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. He said, and then laughed. That's silly. There's one too many. The match went out and he lit another and began to count. As he, he got as far as 12 and then looked puzzled. There are 13 people here, he said. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense, Jackson laughed. You probably began with yourself and now you want to count yourself twice. Reggie took the electric torch, which I assume is like a flashlight. flashlight. I'm getting goosebumps already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It gave better light than the matches, and all the guests began to count. They all counted 12 people. Jack laughed. Well, I was sure I counted 13 twice. About halfway up the stairs, Violet spoke nervously. I thought there was someone sitting two steps above me. Mm. Have you moved, Captain Ransom? The captain said he hadn't, but he commented that he thought someone had been sitting between him and Violet. The entire group felt uneasy. They brushed it off as nothing and went back to the living room to start the game again. Oh my god, I'm so cold. <laughs> It worked! <laughs> and this is just the first story. I can, like, picture it so clearly in my head, like, with the match and looking at the narrow staircase, like, oh, it's freaking me out. Okay. It's not even, the, the second one's even creepier than this. Oh, God. <laughs> the second one, I got creeped out again as I was writing it. <laughs> so, they brushed it off as nothing and went back to the living room to start the game again. This time, Jackson was Smee. This round did not last very long, and soon everyone had found Smee. As they were getting ready to play another round, Reggie pulled Jackson aside. He seemed to be worked up about something that had happened. Jackson, Jackson asked him what was wrong, and that was when Reggie told him, I don't know. You were Smee last time, weren't you? Well, of course. I didn't know who Smee was. While Mother and the others ran to the west side of the house and found you, I went to the east. There's a wardrobe that is in my bedroom. It looked like a good hiding place. I thought perhaps Smee might be there. I opened the door in the dark, and I touched someone's hand. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. I thought I found Smee. Well, I don't understand it, but suddenly I had a strange cold feeling. Did he hide in there with them? I can't describe it, but I felt that something was wrong. So I turned on my electric torch and there was nobody there. Now, I am sure I touched a hand and nobody could get out of, get out of the wardrobe because I was standing in the doorway. What do you think? 
You imagine that you touched a hand, replied Jackson. Reggie gave a short laugh. I knew you would say that. Of course I imagined it. That's the only explanation, isn't it? No. (laughs) (laughs) This is so fun, being on this end of things. (laughs) Jackson agreed, and they both went back to the sitting room to join the others. This time, Jackson could tell that the group did not seem to be enjoying themselves as much as they had before. Jackson was thinking of all the strange occurrences from the evening and couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As they began the game again, everyone ran around shouting Smee throughout the house. Jackson decided to search along the west side of the house, and as he was feeling his way along, he bumped into a pair of knees. No, oh, stop. <laughs> he noticed a large, soft, heavy curtain that covered the tall windows. He opened the curtain and saw the dark, tall, pale girl sitting in the window seat. Aha! shouted Jackson. I've caught Smee. He touched the woman's arm and asked, Smee? In a low voice? She did not answer him. So Jackson sat down beside the woman. He asked her what her name was, and she replied, Brenda Ford. Jackson tried to make small talk with this woman, but she hardly gave any responses. Jackson assumed it was because they needed to stay silent for the game, or maybe the woman just didn't like him. As time passed, and it was just Jackson and Brenda, Jackson began to grow very uneasy and uncomfortable sitting next to her, secretly praying that someone would come to join them soon. To his relief, Jackson heard light footsteps coming down the passageway. When the person moved the curtain aside, it was Mrs. Gorman from the party. She whispered, Smee, and was, of course, met with no answer. She asked Jackson if he was Smee, and he told her that it was the woman next to him. Mrs. Gorman tried to make small talk with the woman, but just as Jackson had, gave little to no response. And was this the lady who was at dinner? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. As Mrs. Gorman and Jackson waited for the others, they discussed their disinterest in continuing the game. They were getting concerned that others would never be able to find them. Finally, they heard Reggie's voice calling for them. Once Reggie found them, he asked, "'What happened to you? You both lost. We've been waiting for you for hours.' But you haven't found Smee yet, complained Jackson. You mean you haven't. I was Smee this time, Reggie told them. But Smee is here with us, Jackson argued, and Mrs. Gorman agreed with him. When Reggie pulled back the curtain and shined the light on the seat, there was no one sitting there. Of course there wasn't. (laughs) There was somebody there, insisted Jackson, because I touched her. So did I, said Mrs. Gorman in a trembling voice, and I don't think anyone could leave this window seat without us knowing. Reggie gave them a shaking laugh and asked him if they were going to come down to the living room. Once they joined the group, Reggie announced where he had found the last two players. At this time, Jackson had walked up to the tall, dark, pale woman and said, So you pretended to be Smee and then went away? And she just shook her head. The group decided to play some cards instead, and Jackson was relieved. A bit later, Jack pulled Jackson aside to talk to him about what he was really doing with Mrs. Gorman. Jack thought that the two were getting cozy, and that was why they were really hiding. But we were not alone, Jackson protested. There was somebody else there, somebody who was pretending to be Smee. I believe it was that tall, dark girl, Miss Ford. She whispered her name to me. Of course, she refused to admit it afterwards. Jack just stared. Miss who? He breathed. Brenda Ford. Jack put a hand on Jackson's shoulder. Look here, Tony. That's his first name. He began. I don't mind a joke, but enough is enough. We don't want to worry the ladies. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs. She was playing hide and seek here 10 years ago. The end. Mm. I (laughs) know. Mm-mm. So was he the only one who could see her at dinner and stuff then? No, because remember they counted 13 people? Ew. Mm -hmm. That makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I don't like that. That's only story number one. Story number two. Did you ever play like dark hide and seek when you were younger? Yeah. 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 We would play flashlight hide and seek. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Did not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thinking about it, hide and seek is so freaking creepy. And they do it in so many horror movies because you're by yourself in a room. But just so the guy who was in the room with her by himself, like, yeah, it's kind of like he was sitting in this dark room by himself. Yeah. Which is also just so freaking creepy. I just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not going to like this one. Oh, good. So our last tale is brought to you by Jeanette Win- Winterson, whose story was published in The Guardian as one of their Christmas ghost stories. So in this story, I've included a lot more direct quotes from her story itself because I felt she worded them really well and it kind of helped give it that eerie tone. But I'm not going to say, quote, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Because it's, it's just implied. Okay. So the title of this is Dark Christmas. Okay. So we're going to assume that the narrator is Jeanette in order to make this story third person instead of first person. Okay. Okay. So this Christmas, Jeanette and her friends decided to rent a house out yonder to celebrate the jolly holiday. The high fallen house was a large Victorian home that overlooked the sea. Jeanette was the first to arrive and her friends, Stephen and Susie, would arrive tomorrow by train. As Jeanette pulled up to the house, she noticed a large do not enter sign that hung over the entryway to the locked up garden. The housekeeper 
had warned her that the wall to the garden was unsafe. She pulled up to the house with a tree tied to the car and assortment of other holiday accoutrements. The house was far from any town, so she made sure to, that they had everything they needed. Jeanette made her way into the kitchen and got a fire going. The kitchen was quaint. Jeanette got her radio turned on and checked her phone. No service. No worries. She knew the time the train was supposed to arrive, so she wouldn't miss picking up her friends. So it's just going to be like the three of them. Mm -hmm. So she's alone mm -hmm. by herself. Mm -hmm. Okay. As soon as I read that first part... That her friends weren't coming till the next day. I was like, nah. -uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck that. Absolutely no. not. So. I drive to where you are and I take the train with you. I do not go by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Jeanette put her food in the oven. Uh, uh, Jeanette put her food. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeanette put her food heated up in the oven. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the heated up food goes in the oven. Yeah. Jeanette put her food in the oven to heat up. <laughs> and brought her belongings upstairs. Jeanette's own thoughts describe the scene best. I'm not a romantic about maids rooms or nurseries, and there was something about that second set of stairs that made me hesitate. The landing was bright in the sudden way of late sun on a winter's afternoon, yet the light ended abruptly at the foot of the stairs, as though it couldn't go any further. I didn't want to be near the set of stairs, so I chose the room at the front of the house. Valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As she was putting her things away, she heard the bell ring for the front door. Odd, but Jeanette assumed that it might have been the housekeeper stopping by to check in. When she opened the door, no one was there. Nope. Mm -mm. Now Jeanette was a bit worried. I'm getting a hotel. <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> this is like not even. Oh, God. Uh, now Jeanette was a bit worried. She mustered up some courage and she went to take a look around. When she turned to look back at the house, she saw the bell wire tread along the gutter of the house with 30 to 40 bats hanging from it. Of course, nothing to worry about. Not time to eat. Uh -huh. She ate, she drank, she wondered why she wondered why love was so hard and life was so short. <laughs> After her long day, Jeanette was ready for sleep, so she made her way back to her bedroom. Jeanette was woken from her sleep by the sound. Mm -mm. Of what? Maybe a marble rolling across the floor? Whatever it was rolled back in the other direction. That can't be right, because that would mean the ball would be rolling upwards. Things can get loose and roll down, but not up. Jeanette pushed the thought from her mind and chalked it up to what animal or weather made its way into the attic, and she pretended not to listen. But she heard it again. She waited for sleep and daylight. Jeanette thought to herself, we are lucky, even the worst of us, because daylight comes. It was December 21st, the shortest day of the year. Jeanette grabbed her coffee, keys, and coat and was making her way to the car when she stopped and thought, should I just check the attic? No. Never by yourself. I said, so I wrote this in. Jeanette would soon learn she should not have checked the attic. <laughs> <laughs> Like, why do people always do this? Like, let me be alone. This is not, this is just the, the tipping scale of the weird ass decision she decides to oh, make alone. Janet. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> The stairs to the attic were narrow, barely a shoulder width wide. There were three doors. Two of them are closed, but the one above Jeanette's room was ajar. She decided to take a look. There was only a washstand and a clothesline. In the uh, attic. Yeah. There was only a washstand and some clothes, no bed. And Jeanette noticed a nativity scene that sat in the middle of the room. It was homemade, old, and worn from time. Jeanette decided that it'd be a nice addition to the tree, so she grabbed the figurines and put them in her pockets. Why? God. She... Because she thought it'd be a nice addition to their tree. She left the rest for Susie and Stephen to help her with, and she left for the train station, leaving the door to the room open behind her. She made her way to the train station, admiring the drive along the coast. The train station was simple, with a small overhang, but no schedule board. Where are we? Like what? Somewhere in England. Okay. I think. I assume. Okay. Just because of the way that she talked, it sounded British. <laughs> <laughs> I Americanized it. <laughs> she checked her phone, and she still didn't have a, a signal. After some time, the train finally arrived at the station. The captain departed from the train, but his was the only door that opened. Jeanette waved him over and told him that she was waiting for her friends. The captain told her that no one else was on the train, and the next stop was last on the track. Jeanette didn't understand. Could they possibly have gotten off at the wrong stop? She began to describe her friends to the man, but he just shook his head and said, I know to strangers. They would have boarded at Carlisle, asked me where to get off. Always do. Is there another train before tomorrow? Jeanette asked. One day, and that's your lot, and more than anybody needs in a place like this. Where are you staying? High Fallen House. Do you know it? Oh, aye. We all know it. He looked as if he were about to say something else. Instead, he blew his whistle. 
The empty train pulled away, leaving her staring down the long track, watching red, watching the red light like a warning. Jeanette knew she needed to get cell service so she could get in touch with her friends. She went up a small hill where she had hoped to get a signal. She could see along the coast and the looming Victorian in the distance. Walking along the beach, she saw two figures, one taller than the other. She thought for a moment that they could be her friends who may have decided to drive to the house after all. But a closer look made her realize that one of the figures was significantly taller than the other, almost like a parent to a child. She knew that couldn't be her friends, but who? When she arrived back at the house, it was practically nighttime. Jeanette lit a fire in the kitchen and poured herself a glass of whiskey. On the table were the figurines she had put in her coat from the nativity scene. She knew she needed to go back to the attic to get the rest, but she hesitated to return to the creepy attic. At night, mm -hmm. by yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. It gets better. <laughs> she mustered up some courage and began to climb the stairs to the second floor. She turned on a light to see better, and the stairs to the attic lay ahead of her. She flickered on another light that would light the stairs to the attic, and she began to climb. She opened the door to the room she had gone in before. Hadn't I left that open? She thought to herself. She turned on the light in the room, and reluctantly, the light flickered to life. Washstand, nativity, clothes rail. She noticed a little girl's dress hanging from the clothes rail. She hadn't noticed it before. She just assumed she had missed it when she had been in the room earlier. She had just gotten the wooden nativity uh, stable in her arms when the light went out. Mm. She could hear someone breathing behind mm, her. Mm, mm. Not heavy breathing, but as if someone was struggling to breathe. Oh, God. Jeanette didn't dare turn around to see what or who may have been behind her. She steadied herself and began to walk towards the door. There was a sliver of light shining from the light downstairs. When she was at the doorway, she heard a step behind her. She lost her footing and reached out and grabbed something when her hand touched something wet. It was the child's dress hanging from the clothes rail. Don't panic. Bake light, bad wiring, strange house, darkness, aloneness, she said to herself. But was she alone? Back in the kitchen, she was examining the child's dress as she cooked herself some pasta. She decided there, mu uh, there must be a hole of some sort in the roof in the attic, and that was the reason that the dress was wet and smelled moldy. Naturally, yes. Mm -hmm. She decided to wash it and hang it over the sink to dry. She had eaten her dinner and read for a bit. It was only 8 p.m., but she had no desire to go to sleep. She decided she was going to set up the nativity scene. Donkey, sheep, camels, wise men, shepherd, star, Joseph. The crib was there, but it was empty. There was no Christ child, oh, and gosh. there was no Mary. Had she dropped them in the dark room? I hadn't heard anything fall, and these wooden figures were six inches tall. Huh. That rhymes. <laughs> Joseph was wearing a woolen tunic, but his wooden legs had painted putties, which is a long strip of cloth wound spirally around the leg from the ankle to the knee for protection and support. Okay. Because I didn't know what that was. Yeah, I didn't know what that was either. <laughs> she pulled off the tunic. Underneath, wooden Joseph wore a painted uniform. First World War. When she turned him around, she saw there was a gash in his back like a stab wound. Just then, her phone beeped. She dropped Joseph and grabbed the phone. It was a text message from Susie. Trying to call you. Leave tomorrow. She pressed call. Nothing. She tried to send a text. Nothing. But what did it matter? Suddenly, she felt relieved and calm. They had been delayed. That was all. Tomorrow, they will be here. She sat down again with the nativity. Perhaps the missing figures were inside. She put her hand in, and her fingers closed around a metal object. It was a small iron key with a hoop top. Maybe it was the key to the attic door. Wait, where did she reach in for this key? The nativity. See? Like in the... Oh, okay, okay. Whatever that <clears throat> thing is. The barn? Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the snow had stopped falling, and the bright moon shined through the windows. Jeanette had decided to go to bed, and just like the night before, she was woken from her deep sleep to a noise above her. She could hear the sound of someone pacing back and forth in the room. She wanted to turn on the light, but is afraid it wouldn't work. <laughs> she, <laughs> I thought that part was funny. I guess that would be worse than, yeah. you know. She sat up in bed and pulled the curtain back, the moon shining brightly in the night sky. Outside the house, hand in hand, stood the still and silent figures of a mother and child. No. Oh, no. Jeanette did not go back to sleep after that. When she did go back to sleep, she finally woke about midday, and she could tell the sun was about to set again. No. She needed to get out of the house. She threw some clothes on, grabbed a coffee from the kitchen. The dress was gone, although she was sure she had left it hanging there over the sink the night before. I like how coffee is a priority. Get out of the house. Get my coffee. Get out of the house. Mm -hmm. Dress is gone. Yeah. At the station, she waited. She waited some time past the time her friends were supposed to arrive until the train whistled on the track. The train stopped. The guard got down and saw her. He shook his head. There's no one, he said. No one at all. Jeanette thought she would cry. She took out her mute phone. She flashed up the message, trying to call you. Leave tomorrow. The guard looked at it. Happen, it's you who should be leaving, he said. There's no more trains past Carlisle now till the 27th. Tomorrow was the last, and that's been canceled. Weather. 
Jeanette wrote down a number and gave it to the guard. Will you phone my friends and tell them I am on my way home? On the slow journey back to High Fallen House, her mind filled with her departure. It would be slow and dangerous to travel at night, but she could not dare consider another night alone. Or not alone. <laughs> All she had to do was manage 40 miles to Inch Barn. See, I think it's so funny. Other countries and places are like 40 miles. God, that's so long. And here we're mm-hmm. like... I drive 40 miles to go see my mom. Okay. So when I read this, I was like, that's so fucking close. What do you mean? Right. Like, what? I thought she was in the middle of fucking nowhere. Like, like I'll read things from other countries. And they're like, yeah, I don't see my family much. Like, we live 45 minutes away. And I'm like, I go see my mom every week and we live an hour away. That's child's play. Yeah. So in Inchbarn, there's a pub and a guest house and a remote but normal life. And the text message kept playing in her head. Had it really meant that I should leave? And why? Because Susie and Steven couldn't come? Weather? Illness? It's all a guessing game. The fact is, I have to go. She what year herself. was this? Because I'm thinking, if I'm it not didn't... meeting you, I'm writing you a long text message to very much explain why I'm not coming, not call. Leave tomorrow. It didn't say. Hmm. But I'm assuming a time that they had cell phones. Or maybe a time when you're, like, paying for each letter. Yeah, because the, the way that tomorrow is spelled is T-M-O-R-O. Oh. Call you, leave tomorrow. Ah. Yeah. So... Shorthand. When you had to press like five times to get to you. (laughs) Tomorrow's a long word when you have to do that. (laughs) Jeanette hurried into the house to to pack up all her things. Uh, She could get to Inch Barn by nine if she left now. All her things were packed and she ran back out to the car and turned it on. It came to life for a quick moment and then nothing. (gasps) She tried again. Nothing. The car had worked just fine when she had, she had it at the train station. She knew she couldn't sleep in her car because it was too cold outside, but the idea of having to spend another night in the house did not bring her any comfort. Oh, no. Jeanette did everything she could to stay awake. She wandered around the house and read various old books she found. She came across an old photo album that showed her a window to the past. She saw a group photo, most likely from a wedding, in front of High Fallen House, dated 1910. There was a picture of Mary and Joseph Locke, dated 1912. He was the gardener and she was the maid. There was another photo dated 1914 of a man in uniform. Jeanette brought the album back to the kitchen and placed it next to her soldier. She had set up a couple of chairs and started to doze in and out of sleep. It was perhaps two o'clock in the morning when she heard a child crying. I just want to say no one saw the really evil smile Mackenzie just had. (laughs) (laughs) It was perhaps two o'clock when she heard a child crying. Not a child who had scraped his knee or a lost toy, but an abandoned child. A child whose own voice in his last whole... On life, a child who cries and knows that no one will come. The sound was not above her. It was above the above. Uh, mm, mm, She knew exactly where it was coming from. She put her hands over her ears and her head between her knees, but she could not shut out the sound. A locked up child, a hungry child, a child who was cold and wet and frightened. Twice she got up and went to the door. Twice she sat down again. The crying stopped. Silence. A dreadful silence. She raised her head. Footsteps were coming down the stairs. Not one foot in front of the other, but one foot dragging slightly. No, God! Then the other joining it, steadying, stepping again. At the bottom of the stairs, the footsteps paused. Then they did what Jeanette knew they would do with all the terror in her body. The footsteps came towards the kitchen door. Whatever was out there was standing 12 feet away on the other side of the door. Jeanette stood behind the table and picked up a knife. Oh, my God. The door swung open with violent force that rammed the brass doorknob into the plaster of the wall. Wind and snow blew in the kitchen, whirling up the photographs and cutting, and cuttings on the table. Jeanette saw that the front door itself was wide open. The entrance hall like a wind tunnel. Holding the knife, she went forward into the hall to shut the door. The wind blew so violently it knocked a, uh, the lantern light from the ceiling and it crashed into the fan, like the ceiling fan. Both of them crashed into pieces on the floor. Jeanette was now in complete darkness. She walked out of the house and towards the drive, and when she turned, she saw them, a woman and her child. The child was wearing the woolen dress with no shoes and was whining to her mother to be picked up. Her mother was as still as a statue. Jeanette went to pick up the child, but there was no child. She fell forward into the snow. She heard a faint, help me. That was not coming from her own voice. It was someone else's. She quickly got to her feet and ran towards the locked garden. A rusty handle to the door fell and Jeanette was able to kick the door open. She followed the footprints to a small cottage. There was no door. There was a calendar on the wall that said December 22nd, 1916. Jeanette heard a sound from across the room. She looked and saw a small fire had been lit and the mother and child were sitting in front of it. The mother was Mary Locke. Jeanette recognized her from the photograph. She looked at Jeanette with an expressionless eyes. She nodded at something behind her. Jeanette turned around and saw a locked cupboard. She already knew the key she found would fit into that lock. Mm -hmm. The one she found in the nativity scene. 
Jeanette opened the cupboard. A dusty uniform fell out, crumpled like a puppet. The uniform was not quite empty of its occupant. Mm. The back of the faded wool jacket had a long slash where the lungs would have been. Jeanette looked down at the knife in her hand. Open the door. Are you in there? Open the door. Jeanette woke to a blinding light. Where am I? She thought. Something's rocking. It's her car. She was in her car. A heavy glove was brushing off the snow. She sat up, found her keys, and pressed the unlocked button. It was morning. Outside, the guard from the train and a woman who announced herself as Mrs. Wormwood. Fine mess you've made here, she said. We went into the kitchen. Jeanette was sh shivering so much that Mrs. Wormwood relented and began to make some coffee. Alfie fetched me, she said, after you spoke to your friends. There's a body, Jeanette said, in the, in the walled garden. Is that where it is? said Mrs. Wormwood. Oh. <laughs> At Christmas, 1914, Joseph Locke had gone to war. Before he left for Flanders, he had made a nativity scene for his little girl. When he came back in 1916, he had been gassed. They heard him climbing the stairs, gasping for breath through froth corrupted lungs. His mind had gone, they said, and at night, the attic where he slept with his wife and child, he leaned vacantly against the wall, rolling the child's marbles up and down, down and up, pacing, pacing, pacing. One night, just before Christmas, he strangled his wife <gasps> and daughter. He left them for dead in the bed and went out, but his wife was not dead. She followed him. In the morning, they found her sitting by the nativity, her dress dark with blood, his finger marks livid in her at her throat. She was singing a lullaby and pushing the point of the knife into the back of the wooden figure. Joseph was never found. Are you going to call the police? Jeanette asked. What for? said Mrs. Wormwood. Let the dead bury the dead. Alfie the guard went out to look at Jeanette's car. It started just fine the first time. The exhaust was blue in the white air. Jeanette left them clearing up and was about to set off when she remembered she had left the radio in the kitchen. She went back inside. The kitchen was empty. She could hear the two of them up in the attic. She picked up the radio. The nativity was on the table as she had left it. But it wasn't as she had left it. Joseph was there, and the animals and the shepherds and the worn-out star, and at the center was the crib, and next to the crib were the wooden figurines of a mother and child. The end. Creepy. Hell yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I can see why that freaked you out while you were home alone. Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> and then when, what, some, like, dishes fell in your sink or something? There was, like, a clink. Oh, And God. I was like, what was was that the marble? Because uh, last night is when I started to write this story. Oh, yeah. I had read it the first time the when I was texting you about it. And again, my neighbor's door had slammed. <gasps> and I jumped. <laughs> I had to stop watching the paranormal, like, BuzzFeed thing that I was watching. Oh, yeah. Just because his voice is makes he, it sound creepy. He can make it sound very creepy, And I was yeah. like, I, I can't watch this and read this and write this all at the same time. It is too much. I'm freaked out. <laughs> But it's so funny because reading these fictional stories, I was far more freaked out than any of the other stories of the haunted places or crimes that I ever read yeah. for this. I don't know why, but like this shit gave me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, I got chills a couple times through it, but I don't want to interrupt you. So I just didn't say like, oh, I got chills again. <laughs> the only reason why I can read these things without being like too freaked out is because nothing can pop out at you. Right, right. Like, could you imagine in a movie when she would walk out and turn and there were the people? Oh, no. Like, you would have, it would have been like loud music and be like, ba-bam, and then scared shitless. I've, I read somewhere that horror movies are a lot less scary to watch if you watch them on silent. That's <laughs> that too. Well, because you always know when something's going to happen because, because it goes music. stupid silent. Yeah. And then you know, it's like in Jaws, you know the shark's coming because there's dun, literally dun. music playing. Dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah. So those are my scary ghost stories. Ooh. I think there was, I read somewhere a long time ago that I think the Christmas tradition used to be to sit around and tell scary stories. Yep. That's exactly all the things I was reading about because they say that around this time is when there are more spirits and things like that that are out and about. Some say because of the winter solstice mm. and, you know, it's starting and like, it's kind of like starting new because yeah. it's when the days start to get longer again. Mm -hmm. And so there's usually a higher, whatever you want to call it, of spirit activity. And so it used to be very traditional to tell creepy stories. I love that. I think we're coming so. up to the winter solstice very soon. This will come out on the winter solstice. On it? If it's the 21st. <gasps> oh, how, what amazing planning that we didn't plan at all, but Look what amazing ways thing work out. We're just that freaking good. That is awesome. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, this was a good one. Yeah. Ooh, I really enjoy being on this side of it and I being scared by your story. I'm glad scares you. I'm kind of <laughs> proud of myself. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, happy holidays happy to everyone. Happy holidays. Whatever you celebrate, we hope you get to do it the way you want to. And get to spend it with whom you'd like to. Exactly. So I think that's all we have. That's it. So stay scary. Stay safe. Stay safe.